The devastated world lay in ruin, and Ronan found himself surrounded by the aftermath of a battle against destructive giants. His adversary, the giant Ahiyuri, spoke to him, revealing that Ronan was on the verge of death. Ahiyuri recounted the giant's invasion, which occurred twenty days prior, bringing chaos and destruction for unknown reasons as to why they invaded. Despite Ronan's inquiry about Ahiyuri's survival after wreaking havoc, Ahiyuri assured him of his imminent demise. Ronan countered by sharing that the other giants awaited Ahiyuri's death, mentioning one burnt by a red dragon and another sealed by a man named Lorna Magician. Ahiyuri, undeterred, claimed victory, asserting that the giants had successfully eliminated those who challenged them. As Ronan asserted his strength, Ahiyuri reveled in the satisfaction of Ronan's impending death. Ahiyuri acknowledged Ronan's accomplishments but warned of the impending doom, which everything will be buried the starlight. In a sudden turn, Ronan beheaded Ahiyuri, determined to press on. During his journey, he encountered his grand commander, Adeshin, miraculously alive but missing an arm. Ronan informed Ezen of Ahiyuri's defeat and, in the midst of their conversation, new giants appeared out from nowhere shocking them. They had so much difficult in defeating just three. Now how will they manage to defeat the, the newcomers? Adeshin was in deep thought regretting her choice or wasting all her opportunities reincarnating. She decides to give her last orb for reincarnation to Ronan, who was getting ready to face the giants. Unexpectedly, the rain ceased, and Ronan found himself back in his childhood village. Ezen had used the orb to send him to the past, offering a chance to alter the future. Reflecting on his life, Ronan decided to change the destiny and faith of the whole world. Intervening to protect a bullied boy Ronan wasted no time in messing up the bully leading to an unexpected encounter with Asil who is a magician and is able to use telekinesis. The narrative unfolded as Ronan and his newfound companion, Asil, embarked on a journey to attend a magic academy. Encounters with the Caliboro poaching group, a mystical bird, and a communication with Professor Varen added complexity to the tale. Challenges, including a daring heist against lunar goblins, further unfolded. Ronan's path intersected with a merchant named and his daughter Maria, revealing past connections and adding humor to the narrative. The story wove together elements of fantasy, combat, and time travel, promising an engaging and unpredictable journey for Ronan and his companions. Ronan, realizing the potential of Asil's magical abilities, offered to help her improve. Asil hesitated but agreed, and Ronan became Asil's mentor, teaching him combat skills and refining his, his usage of mana with Maria since he is incapable of that. The two formed an unexpected bond as they trained together Maria and Ronan. Ronan and his companions embarked on a new chapter at Phil Leon Academy, facing challenges and making new acquaintances. The narrative unfolded with intriguing twists, introducing mysteries surrounding celestial beings, magical creatures, and a looming threat that hinted at a greater destiny awaiting them. The tale continued to weave together elements of fantasy, magic, and personal growth, promising an engaging and unpredictable journey for Ronan and his companions. The exploration of Ronan's past and the interconnected threads of fate added depth to the evolving narrative. Important, real-life experience and practical skills are equally crucial for success at Phil Leon Academy. Ronan reassured Asil that he believed in his abilities and that this experience would serve as valuable training. Asil, still hesitant but motivated by Ronan's confidence, reluctantly agreed to attempt the mission. Under the moonlit sky, Ronan and Asil approached the location where the lunar goblins were known to gather. Ronan instructed Asil to focus his telekinesis on the treasures, ensuring a silent and swift operation. Asil concentrated, and with a careful touch of telekinesis, he began transferring the stolen treasures into Ronan's bag. The process was tense, but Asil managed to skillfully execute the task without alerting the goblins. Just as they were about to complete the mission, a sudden noise disrupted the silence. The lunar goblins were stirred, sensing the intrusion. Ronan and Asil realized they had to act quickly to avoid a confrontation. With precise coordination, Ronan and Asil retreated into the shadows, escaping the goblins' notice. They successfully avoided the potential danger, and the stolen treasures were safely secured. Maria intrigued by Ronan's fighting style, agreed to sell him the Black Iron Sword. As they concluded their business, the merchant insisted on giving Ronan and Asil a discount as a gesture of goodwill. Ronan appreciated the kind gesture and promised to visit the merchant again. After leaving the merchant's shop, Ronan and Asil continued their preparations for Phil Leon Academy. Ronan, now equipped with the Black Iron Sword, felt a renewed sense of confidence. 
The odd-looking egg that Ronan had kept also continued to pique his curiosity. Their journey to the prestigious academy seemed to be filled with unexpected encounters, challenges, and the forging of new connections. The narrative continued to weave a tale of adventure, friendship, and the pursuit of greatness in the face of daunting odds. The story, blending elements of magic, combat, and unexpected humor, promised further exploration of Ronan and Assel's quest for success in the competitive environment of Phil Leon Academy. Dedicated researcher and a key figure in the study of mystical beasts. He had developed a fondness for Marpez, the dream bird, and considered him a valuable companion in his research. As Ronan and Assel entered Phil Leon Academy, the atmosphere was bustling with energy. The test day brought together aspiring students from various backgrounds, each eager to showcase their skills and secure a spot in the prestigious institution. The feather from Marpez pointed directly to Varon Fozier's office, guiding Ronan to the zoology professor. As they approached the tall building, Ronan felt a mix of excitement and determination. The encounter with Maria had given him a taste of the challenges he would face, but he was ready to prove himself. Upon reaching Varon Fozier's office using the window, revealing the professor in the midst of arranging various documents and specimens. Marpez perched on Varon's shoulder, chirping happily at the sight of Ronan. Varon greeted them warmly, expressing gratitude for Ronan's earlier assistance in saving Marpez. He also acknowledged the significance of the dream bird's feather, indicating a connection between Ronan and the Academy's zoology department. As Ronan prepared for the test, he couldn't help but think about the encounters and experiences that had led him to this moment. The journey from battling goblins to sparring with Maria had shaped him into a more focused and determined individual. The test day at Phil Leon Academy promised not only an evaluation of their skills but also the beginning of a new chapter for Ronan and Assel. The Academy, with its rich history and renowned instructors, held the potential to unlock their true potential and set them on a path towards greatness. The narrative continued to unfold, weaving together elements of magic, combat, and personal growth. The challenges and opportunities presented at Phil Leon Academy awaited Ronan and Assel, promising a journey filled with surprises, friendships, and the pursuit of excellence. Ronan had defeated the Sword Saint, Schlieffen in his previous life in the entrance exams. And ever since then, Schlieffen harbored resentment and sought every opportunity to challenge Ronan. As S. Schlieffen approached, he wore an expression that mixed surprise and disbelief. He couldn't fathom how someone like Ronan, who seemed inexperienced and lacked proper manners, could outperform him in the practical exam. Ronan, on the other hand, braced himself for a confrontation. He knew Schlieffen wouldn't take this defeat lightly, and he was prepared for any provocation. Maria sensed the tension and took a step back, allowing the two swordsmen to face each other. Schlieffen, with a grin, told Ronan that he looked forward to seeing him in action during their time at the academy. Ronan wondered what other surprises awaited him in this new chapter of his life. The narrative unfolded, blending elements of rivalry, camaraderie, and the mysteries surrounding Marpez's egg. As Ronan and his companions delved deeper into the academy, they would discover the true extent of their abilities and the secrets hidden within its ancient walls. Like a dragon, but he realized that it was not an ordinary dragon. The creature had wings, scales, and a tail, but its body was covered in feathers, and it had a majestic, otherworldly presence. The newly hatched creature extended its wings and let out a gentle cry. Ronan, in awe of the majestic being before him, felt a strong connection with the creature. Assel, equally fascinated, asked Ronan what kind of creature it was. Ronan, unsure of the creature's exact nature, named it Sita, combining the dragon-like and bird-like features. The Sita seemed to respond positively to its name, and Ronan could feel a magical energy emanating from it. In that moment, the dream bird nuzzled Ronan's cheek, expressing a bond between them. Ronan realized that this creature was truly unique. Assel, still amazed by the unexpected turn of events, suggested that they return to Professor Vaughn and seek guidance on how to care for the dream bird. Ronan agreed, carefully cradling the dream bird in his arms. Back in the capital, Ronan and Assel made their way to the Phil Leon Academy. The dream bird, seemingly comfortable with Ronan, nestled against him as they walked. When Ronan recalling the encounter in Shimo Forest, the attack by Calibro's hunting dogs, and the absorbing of the blood by the egg. The academy, once a place of learning and training, now became the stage for a grand adventure that would shape the destiny of Ronan, his friends, and the magical realm they inhabited. This bold proposal from a freshman. 
they couldn't believe that Ronan, a newcomer, dared to challenge all four seniors simultaneously. The principal, intrigued by Ronan's confidence, decided to allow the unconventional request. He announced to the crowd that Ronan would face all four seniors at once, making the duel even more exciting for the spectators. The arena buzzed with anticipation as Nasto, Brown, Karun, and Irina prepared for the unique challenge. The seniors exchanged confident glances, believing that this audacious freshman had no chance against their combined strength and skill. The duel began, and Ronan immediately faced the onslaught of attacks from all directions. The seniors, coordinating their movements, aimed to overwhelm him with a barrage of martial techniques. However, Ronan, with his exceptional swordsmanship and agility, skillfully evaded their attacks. The crowd watched in amazement as Ronan parried, dodged, and countered each strike with precision. As the duel progressed, Ronan's strategic thinking became apparent. He exploited openings in the seniors' defenses, using their own attacks against each other. The seniors, initially confident, started to show signs of frustration as Ronan held his ground. The arena echoed with the clash of weapons creating a spectacle that captivated both students and professors. Eventually, Ronan seized an opportunity to disarm one of the seniors, creating an opening for a powerful counterattack. In a swift move, he incapacitated another senior, leaving only two standing. The remaining seniors, realizing the unexpected challenge they faced, regrouped and intensified their efforts. However, Ronan's determination and resourcefulness continued to shine, and he managed to hold his own against the formidable opponents. In the end, Ronan's exceptional performance left the arena in stunned silence. The seniors, though battered and impressed, acknowledged the freshman's skills. The principal, recognizing Ronan's courage and the seniors' resilience. The audience erupted in applause, celebrating the unprecedented feat achieved by Ronan. As the freshmen and seniors left the arena, the atmosphere in the academy shifted. Ronan's display of skill and fearlessness had earned him respect and admiration among his peers. The senior-junior meeting, initially designed to establish hierarchy, ended up becoming a showcase of Ronan's prowess and the unpredictable nature of the academy. As Ronan and his fellow students left the arena, they looked forward to the challenges and adventures that awaited them at Phil Leon Academy. Erzabet. She informed Ronan that the talent he displayed in the duel was quite impressive. Erzabet conveyed to Ronan that she wanted to make him an offer he could not have dreamed of. Retrieving a necklace with a purple pendant from her pocket, she surprised Ronan with the Akal USIA invitation. Ronan, in turn, was surprised to see this necklace, recognizing it as the symbol of the Akalushas, noble family distinct for prioritizing talent over bloodlines. Isabel explained that the Akalushia offer opportunities to those displaying potential, allowing them to become part of their family. The necklace symbolized this invitation, and she expressed her belief in Ronan's talent. Curiously, Ronan refrained from asking her about the gift, prompting Erzabet to inquire if he knew the necklace's significance. Ronan recalled someone mentioning it in his past life, specifically Grand Commander Aide Sean Akalushia, who joined the Akalushia family through a similar necklace. Adeshin further elaborated on the Akalushia family's process, mentioning a test administered by the Patriarch to gauge the talents of potential family members. She encouraged Ronan to make up for his life as mercenary Adeshin Akalushia revealed her belief in Ronan's talent and expressed hope for his wise decision. Erzabet, in parting words, advised Ronan that despite being born a beast, if he continued to mingle among the sheep, he would eventually become one. After these words, she left, and Assel felt relieved, while Ronan pondered on the unique attitude of geniuses. Later, Ronan, happy to receive the necklace, believed that the Akalushia would be beneficial to him. He then found himself at Phil Leon Academy, where students' living conditions varied based on their abilities. The dormitory system segregated students, with the top 10% enjoying luxurious accommodations in near Dozer Hall, while the bottom 30% resided in the shabby Crayer Hall. New students expressed dissatisfaction with their assigned hall, but the attendant emphasized the importance of studying hard to improve their conditions. In another scene, Ronan, surprised by the lavishness of near Dozer Hall, found a paper listing the academy's classes on his table. Ronan registered for almost all the classes, eager to learn everything. Despite being eager to learn, he was chased away from all classes due to his proficiency and mastery. 
Ronan's academic journey took an unexpected turn when, in the Empire Swordsmanship Basics class, the instructor, Mr. AAR, asked him to leave, citing his mastery of the syllabus. Disheartened, Ronan sat by a river, contemplating his situation. Instructor Naviros approached him, realizing Ronan had completed most of his classes. To assess his combat skills, she requested Ronan's sword and demonstrated a powerful technique, emphasizing the importance of a suitable weapon on the battlefield. Nabi Rose acknowledged Ronan's lack of mana but commended his energy. She invited him to attend her class, making an exception for a first-year student. Our main character had been kicked out of all his classes because he was just too good. But he's given an opportunity to attend a higher class by the professor, Navaris, the swordsmanship instructor. But before he could join her classes, our main character, Ronan, needs a sword. On a quest to obtaining a new sword, our main character, Ronan, went to a blacksmith and met a werewolf named Didikin. He's an apprentice at the blacksmith shop, but also is a gatekeeper at times to the underground smithy of the Grand Empire, Cappadocia. Now to our current story. Our main character and his friends, led by the werewolf, took an elevator to the underground blacksmith of the Empire, mainly the dwelling of dwarves and other humanoid creatures. Our main character said, to think there was such a huge forge underneath the capital. This was completely unimaginable. Our werewolf responded, indeed, this forge only supplies their items to the royal family, as well as nobles after all. Without any discrimination, other skilled master craftsmen is here. However, the one whom you can call the best out of all of them is the elder dwarf who lives here. Of course, he's the master who smelted metal for over 400 years. The old man is quite stubborn, but his skills are unrivaled, so I respect him. He shouted. The werewolf shouted. What are you doing? Elder, I've brought guests, the werewolf said. The elder dwarf was unfazed. He continued with his work. The elder dwarf said, you're entering while causing a ruckus. Is this Didikin? I told you to be quiet while I'm working. Geez, you really don't listen, you bastard. Ah, what can I do? The werewolf responded. There were weapons in front of the door, so I couldn't open it. So, clean up, Elder Doran told Didikin. For a young guy, you nag a lot. The dwarf elder continued. Anyways, you've brought guests. I assume they are not bad. Of course, of course, the werewolf said. I tested him. He continued. And his saw skills are great. I'm sure you'll be shocked when you see it, the elder responded. Oh, really? That's unexpected. Judging by his looks, he looks like a child. The elder remarked, why don't you show me your sword skills? I can tell a lot of things by just looking. Our main character, Ronan, said, pardon? Huh? Sure. Here I go. Our main character drew on his sword, and the moment his sword was drawn, our dwarf elder saw the shape at which the sword was, and laughed, ha 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 ha, gosh, rubbish. He took our main character's sword and broke it. With a hammer. You are carrying this around as a weapon this whole time? He asked our main character while the sword was being broken into pieces. Oh, you are main character, and his friends were all baffled in bewilderment. Our main character screamed, Wait. What are you doing, old man? The dwarf pointed over there, Swing any of the swords over there. With this trashy sword, I wouldn't be able to accurately get a sense of your skill. I will also give you the sword you choose for free, so don't feel cheated. Since any sword you choose will be a hundred times better than the piece of trash. Our main character asked in bewilderment, Really? Our main character was speechless while Diddy Kong smirked. Our main character headed to where the dwarf pointed to pick up the sword and said, if you insist, then I wouldn't reject. He picked up the sword and said to himself, the vibe is really different, but will it really be that different? He questioned. He said to the elder, it wouldn't be my fault if I destroy something. The dwarf said, yeah. Our dwarf continued, I don't care, so do it properly. Think that you are putting your all into your swing too. Didikin smirked. Then our main character remembered, the vertical slash, Nabris did. He thought of doing that, so he stood into position. Getting ready to swing the sword. Momentum and tension was built. The dwarf recognized that stance and that swing. He recognized the movement. Don't tell me. The dwarf said, our main character did the vertical swing, and a loud bang was heard. There was a large crater on the ground. Other people underground the blacksmiths. Were drawn to the loud sound and explosion. Sound drew the attention of other people on the ground of the blacksmith. One person said, isn't that the Elder Doran's place? Another person said, what's going on? It's just midday. Said, did the furnace explode? The Dwarf Elder was left speechless. Same with our main character, who held the sword vertically. Our main character asked, what just happened? My guy did that and still ask who did ha 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 dot oh you are main character in his mind said, that wasn't my intention. The Dwarf Elder said, the technique is Navaris's. Are you perhaps her apprentices? Ronan, our main character, was baffled by the question. Do you know Instructor Nabris? 
The elder said, of course I do. I'm the one who made her sword. Ronan said, pardon? Is that the sword? That long, stupidly long sword. The elder said, yes. The secret sword, Arusa. I'm the one, it's one of the few masterpieces that I've forged throughout my life. You're holding something that can't be compared to that. But how is it? Is it okay? Ronan said, oh yes, it's really amazing. Honestly, I thought there wasn't much to it. The elder said, that's what I should say. I thought you were a newbie who couldn't judge his own skill well. But it's been a while since I've seen such talent. The elder said that, in happiness, it makes me feel alive. He struck our main character at the back of his head. But it's also a problem if you're too good it can be difficult to forge a sword that suits you. As you can tell from the state of the sword that it is finding it difficult to handle your swings. Normal materials won't last. I need to use the highest grade steel and melt it with a special material. It should be at least a byproduct of a wyvern. Ronan replied, a byproduct? Then what about this? I wasn't sure, so I brought it with me. The elder inquired, that's an eggshell. It switched to the elder trying to break the eggshell. I don't believe it. The elder's hammer was cracked just from hammering the eggshell. This material against my hammer this small eggshell. Except for re-smelting this, I can't do anything else. Ah, what a great sound. The elder was so happy and had a sinister smile on his face. Which made Ronan think that the elder must be crazy. The scene switches to a white person in a clock. I in the dimly lit underground, deeper than the dwarf's abode, a disgruntled voice echoed, the ogres down here are as loud as ever. How annoying. His companion, wearing a mischievous grin, retorted, it's to the point where I want to set them all on fire right now. The person in white clothes intervened, please hold back. It's not the time to reveal ourselves. It won't be that much longer now. With conviction, they continued, starting from those arrogant blacksmiths, everything in this empire. The day that everything disappears and is buried in light is coming. Up to ground level. A few days has passed since the events of the underground transpired. Ronan, our main character, was walking about, thinking about the event that happened underground. He even remarked and said, the old man who is regarded as the best blacksmith in the empire, said that he's going to make my sword himself. His friends, Arsal and Maya, are even commissioning the other blacksmiths in this place too. It looks like it's going to cost quite a lot. Ignoring the financial concerns, Ronan revealed the token given to him by the sword Saint Schlieffen, declaring, we'll cover everything with this. His sinister smile bewildered Maria and Asel, who were left in disbelief. Acknowledging the half-month wait for the new sword, Ronan pondered how to pass the time, considering whether Asel and Maria should be in class. Reflecting on Galilean Hall, the exclusive training center for upperclassmen, Ronan contemplated going there despite previous hesitations. Suddenly, the instructor, Navarosa, appeared, shocking Ronan. Long time no see, Ronan. I told you to come to class right after getting a new weapon. What have you been up to? Are you skipping classes? Ronan, protesting, was dragged along as the instructor insisted, just follow me. I listened to your excuses on the way. Amid Ronan's continued protests, a figure nearby questioned the loud scream, prompting others to join in the inquiry. At that very moment, a collision occurred as Cardin, a male student, bumped into the teaching assistant. Bluntly instructing her to step aside, he cited her as the obstruction. The teaching assistant swiftly apologized, explaining, sorry, I was spacing out. Unimpressed, Cardin retorted, why are you so slow, especially as a teaching assistant? If you have time to space out, quickly prepare for class, moron. Unfazed, the teaching assistant replied, yeah, right. I'll go. The scene transitioned to the sparring center, where all the students had gathered. Navris along with Ronan, addressed the assembly, it was quite noisy during the face-to-face -face ceremony, so some of you may already know him, but I will introduce him once again. This brat is Ronan. He will be attending this class with all of you from today onwards. Ronan, taking the floor, introduced himself, I'm Ronan, a first year from the Master Arts Department. I'll be in your care, seniors, bowing and extending his greetings. As the academy students engaged in lively discussions about Ronan, one wondered, is he the one who got second place among the first years? Another speculated, I suspected he skipped a grade. Someone questioned Ronan's prowess, remarking, is he really that good? He just looks like a dandy, though. Ronan overheard, I can hear everything you've just said. But I'm seeing some faces I don't want to see. Well, I think it will be fun. Suddenly, a latecomer entered, apologizing to the instructor. It was none other than a teaching assistant. Ronan, shocked by the voice, realized, this voice, our teaching instructor said to Navras Navras reassured the assistant, it's fine to catch your breath. I was just introducing a new guy. The teaching assistant revealed Ronan as the famous junior from earlier. Ronan, hearing her voice, thought, Adishan Akalusia, the general acknowledged for her overwhelming commandability. The assistant introduced herself, nice to meet you Ronan. 
I'm Addison, a second year from the martial arts department, the teaching assistant of this class. Let's get along well. Ronan was surprised to see the general in this role and pondered can she make a face like that. Observing other students taking advantage of the teaching assistant's position, Ronan questioned, is the teaching assistant supposed to be like that? He noticed students treating her like a maid, making him shocked and surprised. As Ronan contemplated, a third-year student named Cardin Owen approached him, expressing interest in learning from Ronan and acknowledging his reputation. Ronan, deep in thought, hesitated to respond. Ronan responded to Cardin, can we do it later? Cardin chuckled, right, silly me. How could I not bring my weapon when I'm asking you to spar? Cardin called out to the teaching assistant, oi, moron, bring my practice beer. The teaching assistant responded, ah, all right. I will bring it in no time. Ronan was left in shock, thinking, what? Moron. How dare this person call her that? Meanwhile, Cardin's spear was brought to him. He scoffed, ha, what is this? You idiot, why did you bring me the long spear? Hasn't it been a while since I switched to a short spear? Snatching the spear from the teaching assistant, Cardin left her baffled. She stammered, huh? Huh? You? You did? Didn't you? Cardin retorted, sorry, Cardin, you were using a long spear during the last class. Mocking her, Cardin remarked, ha, look at you. How dare you talk back to me? Is it possible for the teaching assistant not to know this much? He smacked the spear on her head, and she screamed, ouch. Cardin continued his tirade, you are not even qualified to attend classes in the first place, delivering another smack. If you came here after begging the instructor, then you should at least do the chores well. Do you have no conscience? Or are you just that shameless? The teaching assistant apologized again, saying, sorry, Cardin, I will pay more attention. At that moment, Ronan, enraged, held the spear, ready to intervene as it seemed Cardin was about to strike the teaching assistant again. Ronan said to Cardin, let's do it, what you just said. If not, I have no idea what I will do. Cardin responded, what? Hey, what are you on about? Ronan clarified, why don't you understand? Let's bar, you effing. Umbus. This is a bit embarrassing, Cardin said. Did I hear you correctly? What do you not like all of a sudden? Oh. Don't tell me. Are you acting this way because of that moron? Do you know her or something? Or do you just like indecent lowlifes? He licked his lips while saying that. Are you two banging each other without me knowing? Ronan abruptly intervened, saying, hey, just shut up and try to block my attacks. Unless you have a death wish. He said that with an enraged face, swung his sword, and Cardin blocked with his spear, causing it to break. Cardin grinned, thinking, what the hell? How can he be this strong even without mana? He groaned out. Ronan's wooden sword is already suffering from a single swing. Ronan said to Cardin, you were whining about how you don't want to use the long spear. So I changed it up for you. Cardin stood there bewildered with his broken spear. Ronan asked him, do you like it? Cardin screamed in agony, how dare this bastard? He infused his broken spear with mana, swinging it towards Ronan, saying, not knowing your place. Do you think you will still come out unscathed even after this? Ronan stood there unfazed as Cardin approached him. As the broken spear drew closer to him, the spear was cut into pieces. Our main character responded to Cardin, saying, yeah, I think I'll be fine. So, just worry about yourself. He executed continuous slashes, hitting Cardin in the stomach, in the face, and finally giving him an uppercut with a sword, causing him to fly in the sky and hit the ground. Cardin collapsed as a result. Our main character continued to speak, you should be relieved that this is an academy. If we met outside, you would definitely be dead by now. Other students were bewildered, wondering if Cardin lost, as someone mentioned he's a top rank, even among the third years. Now back to Ronan, he said, now, next. Ronan pointed his sword towards a lady who treated Addison, as a slave asking her for a handkerchief. The female student was dripping with sweat, and Ronan said to her, if it smells, you should wash it yourself. Why bother someone else? Is the teaching assistant as a slave? He continued to question the female. The female was scared, but Ronan was still angry and enraged, telling her, come here, I will get rid of all those damn nostrils. Addison told Ronan to stop, but Ronan insisted, saying, I can endure everything else, but this idiot, I mean, anyone else. I just can't see you being looked down upon, at least in this empire, he said to home self. Navi Rose intervened, telling Ronan to stop and drop his sword. 
Ronan questioned if it was Nobby Rose's aura immobilizing him, and he asked if she knew about Addison, being mistreated. Nobby Rose replied, it's between me and my teaching assistant. It's not your business to get involved in. So, this is your last one, Ronan. Stop it. Ronan, with a disgusted face, said, screw you. And Nobby Rose, surrounded by her aura, was speechless for a moment. Ronan stood in a fighting position, dripping with sweat, and the scene cut from there to Ronan calling out to General, asking why he volunteered to take on the role of commander. Addison responded, one day you'll find out too, that there is a destiny in this world, that is unique to you and cannot be passed on to others. That's how he answered, General. What were you thinking? What in the world are you carrying on your shoulders? Ronan pounders. The General called out to Ronan, dripping with blood. Corporal Ronan, I'm genuinely sorry to you. Never forgive me. For passing this burden unto you. Ronan woke up abruptly, shouting, no. He was dripping with sweat pondering on the dream he just had. A figure beside Ronan asked him, Ronan, what's wrong? Did you have a nightmare? Ronan was surprised and thought to himself, General. Adishan asked, General, what do you mean? Ronan responded, ah, chuckled, and said, it's nothing. Adishan was taken aback. Ronan broke the silence, asking, rather than that, is this the clinic? She responded, yeah. That's right. The instructor told me to bring you. Here dot an end, it switched to the instructor, saying, I will correct the behavior you've shown today during the supplement classes. Ronan said in his mind, shit. Questioning himself, should I pass out again? Adeshan abruptly broke his thought, saying, but by the way, Ronan, were you angry for my sake earlier? Ronan was silent for a moment. He responded, no, it's because I value manners a lot, and I am an upright gentleman. Adesham replied, you are a bad liar, aren't you? She continued, it's not just Cardin, please don't hate the others too much, because it's not that I don't understand their feelings either. Ronan, with a disgusted face, responded, how could you say that? What else did you do, other than working hard as a teaching assistant? While we are the topic. Why in the world are you a teaching assistant for that class? Adeshan was a little bit at a loss for words due to his outburst. He continued, isn't that weird, even if we say that she gave in to the students because they are young and were caught up in the moment. We can't ignore the fact that someone we call an instructor is turning a blind eye, even though she is aware of all those things happening. Aren't you even angry? Adeshan responded, if you mean that, I hope you don't misunderstand. The reason why the instructor is acting that way is because I asked her to. Ronan asked, pardon, what is that nonsense? Adeshan continued, that's because I enjoy privileges I don't deserve. Originally, you have to reach the level of a sword expert to attend that class. But even after taking a one-year leave, I could only barely control mana. Ronan questioned himself, what? No way. The general continued, so I separately asked a favor from the instructor to turn a blind eye to whatever treatment the students gave me. Adeshan explained, because I didn't want to burden her when she already accepted me as her teaching assistant and I'm enjoying that kind of privilege. Of course, I have to pay the price for it by enduring this much. I can still handle this. But I also thank you for today, Ronan. I thought that I have gotten used to the trivial things now. But today was a bit painful, she remarked. Ronan inquired, by any chance, is the reason why you are going to such lengths because you want to become a general? Adeshan was baffled and asked, how did you know that? Is it that obvious? She continued, yeah, that's right. I'm still very lacking, so I can't confidently say it. Boldly. But my dream is to become a general of this empire. Of course. I know this may sound reckless coming from someone who hasn't even reached expert level dot, but still, I have no plans to give up. It may not look like it, but I'm confident in my military skills and tactics. And I'm working hard every day. Ah, it's already time for the next class, isn't it? She said to Ronan, you should take a good rest before going back. Got it? Ronan responded, yes, I understand. Thank you for watching over me, Sundia.
Addison replied, it's nothing. It's nothing. Ronan again remembered the last moments with Addison. She had said, Corporal Ronan, if you meet me again, can you tell me to just do tailoring instead of wasting time on nonsense? I've done everything else, but I've never done that. Ronan was a bit confused and asked himself, what do you want me to do, General? The scene cuts from there. A few days later, on the weekend, our three friends head to the Grand Cappadocia Smithy entrance. Ronan inquires, what happened? He wanted us to come. But why isn't anyone here? It cuts to Ronan remembering the invitation. Our main character has been as very impatient lately is all because of his lover. Oops, wrong script. Let's continue, our main character was still ranting in his mind, if you are going to act like this, what was all the fuss about sending a career pigeon in the middle of the night? He continued to speak, even though he said it was his masterpiece and whatnot, it didn't take long before he told us to come over right away. Ronan was as furious. He kicks the helmet, saying, what is this poor treatment? Why? He screams and begins kicking things away. Why are there so many things getting in my way? Is this how you serve your customers? The two girls are a little bit baffled by his outbursts. Assel says, why is he so sensitive these days? Aurel responds, I know right, did something happen in the class he skipped him? It seems even the girls have caught up to his secret. Back to Ronan. He says to the two girls Maria and Assel standing behind him, this won't do, let's just go inside ourselves. The two girls are taken aback. They say to Ronan, wait, can you really just do what you like like that? Ronan responds, he was the one who told us to come first, so what? Stop talking and follow me. The girls obediently follow him. We can see that they are in a place to take the elevator, and Ronan pushes a rock, just like remembering what the werewolf did. And then the elevator begins to move downwards. The two girls are not really up for the plan, but Ronan is so annoyed at the fact that he wasn't greeted at the shop. He says, old man, who doesn't even know the basics of customer service, just see once we meet. I'm going to. And then suddenly, he notices the entire place is on fire and in ruins. He screams in agony. What's going on here? What's wrong with this place? Assel points. Ronan, look over there. It's a giant rock. The giant rock is chasing after the dwarves, and the dwarves run looking for shelter. The blacksmiths are being chased after by giant rocks. Ronan inquires, rock giants? Why would those things be here? Assel speaks up. It looks like they are going to catch the people soon. What do we do? Is there no way we can help? Ronan say what do you think, he carries Assel like a little bunny, and instruct Meyer to go inform the instructors or anybody. Ronan carrying Assel climbs on the ledge of the elevator and jumps. Ronan ever the fighting expert instructs Assel to use telekinesis so that they can land safely. And Assel begins to use telekinesis, shouting, saying, invisible hand. And the same turns to the giant and the dwarves. The giant stood above the dwarves, about to curse them. The dwarves questioned is this the end? Just as the giant was about crush them. Ronan appears and delivers a slash to the giant golem's hand severing it. The monster growls. Just in time Ronan remarked. Finally our main character can vent his frustration. There's a lot on my mind these days, so my head is a bit stuffy. And with a menacing look on his face he said. You guys chose the wrong day to come, you stupid lump of stones, a giant was planning a sneaky attack from behind, but Ronan noticed it. As the giant drew closer to punching Ronan from the back, he quickly hopped on the giant's swung hand and began to dash at speed, slicing through the giant, severing the giant's head from his shoulders, breaking the hand. The giant was in despair as his head flew from his shoulders, the dwarfs that were. Saved by Ronan inquired, is that Brat Doran's guest that came the other day? The other dwarf said, to think such a young guy could defeat a rock giant in one blow, Ronan stood over the giant and said, what in the world is happening here? As he stood over the giant with his sword, he inquired, telling the dwarfs to explain quickly, Ronan and the dwarfs got into a serious conversation, inquiring what had happened. 
the dwarfs explained that dozens of rock giants suddenly barged in a horde, out of nowhere, they just popped out from somewhere underground and destroyed everything as they saw fit, all they did was prey on the blacksmith and capture several of them too, including Doran, then they went back to where they came from, Didi Khan tried to catch after them late, but he wasn't that good at fighting, at this rate, Ronan cut him short, they would become their meal, Ronan said to the dwarf, all right. For now, there's none of those bastards left here, right? He inquired, the dwarf responded, the one you got rid of was the last, Ronan told Asil to go with Maria to check on the others who are injured here until support arrives and to heal them if they find any, he told Asil that if she does it with Sita, it should be enough first aid, Maria asked Ronan, what about you? Ronan said, what do you think? Ronan said to himself, this must be the call of duty I have been hearing about, is this black ops? I have to save the captured old men, there is something I have to get from that old geezer, Doran, it cuts to Doran and Didi Khan, also faced with rock giants, Didi Khan stood steadfast, assured for Doran, Didi Khan said to the old men, hurry up and run, the old men said to Didi Khan, I am grateful that you came after me to save me, but there is no need for you to be here, Didi Khan told the old men to shut up, he continued, things are already tough as it is, so quiet up, and stop spewing all that weak nonsense, if you have the strength to blabber, why don't you hold a sword or something? He inquired, is that for decoration? The old man responded, I can't, this brat is my magnum opus, my monumental first step, I can't dirty it with the swordsmanship of someone like me, Didi Khan screamed in agony, hey, you crazy old bastard, no matter how crazy you are about weapons, this isn't the time for that, while they were in a heated argument, a rock giant stood angrily, screaming, about to crush them, Didi Khan stood right in front of the elder, as the giant struck, Didi Khan blocked the attack, but in the process, he broke all his defenses on his enchanted armor, he pondered to himself, if I had known I would die like this, I would have created everything I wanted to create, I regret it, just as the giant was about to crush them, Didi Khan was sweating profusely, and then suddenly, Ronan appeared, saving Didi Khan, performing slashes and strikes. Ronan swiftly intervened, his sword dancing through the air, deflecting the giant's attacks, he shouted, Oh ye of little faith, your regrets can wait, we've got a giant problem to solve, Didi Khan, catching a breath, muttered, took you long enough, brat, Ronan smirked, better late than never, right? If you have enjoyed the video be sure to subscribe, let's continue, Ronan said to Didi Khan, you fought hard, leave the rest to me and take a breath, Didi Khan and Doran were relieved at the sight of Ronan coming to their rescue, they asked him, how did you come here? There must have been a lot of giants on the way, though, Ronan exclaimed, ah, those bastards. I got rid of all of them while saving the other blacksmiths at the same time. Didi Khan questioned, Uga Ronan, make you the chill small, for these rock giants, they got families Ronan too. told Didi Khan to stop with the small talk and asked the old man to hand him the sword since he can't use the battered one he's holding, the old man handed the sword to Ronan, saying, the sheath is unfinished, so you can use it right away, Ronan thanked the old man and started to unseal the sword from the cloth wrapped around, his eyes fixed on the giants, about to send back to rubbles, at the same moment, a giant stretched forth his hand to grab Ronan, Ronan immediately swung the sword. Baffling the giants who felt fear at that moment, the sheer power of Ronan's strike turned all the rock giants into dust, Ronan was astonished by the power of the sword, questioning, what the hell is this? The old man, excited, eyes sparking, he asked Ronan, do you like La Macha? That's the name of the sword, Ronan asked, La Macha, is that the name of this sword? The old man replied, it's the name I got from my beloved, Stargazer, isn't it great? Ronan said, it's so light that I can feel its weight, but its hardness exceeds Metro, so it can withstand any kind of swordsmanship, on top of that, it even has a unique self-regeneration trait as it absorbs blood, Ronan questioned to himself, is this because it's made of Sita's shell? He thanked the old man, saying, you're more excellent than I thought, old man, the old man, excited, said, it's a relief that you like it, Didi Khan, bewildered by their conversation, asked, is this the time to boast? Urging them to quickly leave, he reminded them that they are at the forefront, and there shouldn't be any more people left, Ronan exclaimed, ah, is that so? Just in time, you should take the old man and leave first, there's something I must check, Didi Khan questioned, something you have to check. Ronan replied, it's nothing much, but I think there are rat bastards hiding here, really big ones at that, 
with his eyes filled with rage. What do you mean by that? The elder inquired, Ronan responded, there's something that's been bothering me. This unseemly behavior of these rock giants, I'm quite familiar with them, so these brats don't flock in groups, and they stay quiet unless you mess with them first, and I've never seen this suspicious tattoo on the back of their heads, the old man, Doran, intervened, a circle magic. Ronan inquired whether he's aware of this or whether he recognized the magic circle. Doran, the dwarf elder, was unsure. He said to Ronan, I'm not that very well versed in it, so I can't be certain, but I know that the mana reverberation that remains here is a pretty insidious one. The giants definitely became violent because of this, who in the world would do this? Ronan responded, I have no idea, well, about that, we can find out if I go further inside. The scene cuts to Ronan. He was dashing inside the cave, pondering to himself, I was on the fence about it, but I feel convinced, the deeper I go inside, among the footprints of giants, I can see footprints of the size of human feet, on top of that, there's even a mana sensing stone for vigilance, they've really planned their way ahead. Ronan abruptly stopped his sprinting at the sight of a light ahead, deep inside the cave, he could hear voices. The two people whose voice was heard by Ronan are revealed as Cyrilla and Eduin. The two enigmatic figures stood right in front of the giant made with crystals, Ronan compares the size of the giant to the ones he fought and captured earlier, he says, the size of this giant makes the ones I fought earlier look like babies, it looks like it is sealed right now, but once that thing starts moving. He is sweating profusely just at the thought of that. The two figures indulge in a conversation, judging by how the brainwashing and the giant are getting cut off one by one, it seems like we have an intruder. It is a bit surprising how the Empire was able to act and react so swiftly, they continue with the conversation. Eduin, the male dressed in a white cloak, says, what are you going to do? There are no more rocks left, and we can't operate on this guy yet, now that it's come to this, should I just kill them all? The female dressed in a cloak, Cyrilla, shakes her head and tells Eduin to forget it, since most of the major facilities have been destroyed, the Empire's weapon manufacturing technology would have regressed a lot, on the contrary, if our identities get revealed, that person won't stay still, so let's back off here. Eduin smirks and says, in that case, Cyrilla, you are too upright, aren't you? At the very same moment, he conjured a fire in his hand, well, I have no other choice then, I will have to unfortunately take care of that, won't I? Cyrilla tells Eduin to do what pleases. Eduin turns to face Ronan while conjuring a fire, noticing him from earlier in his hiding location, he quickly sends his conjured fire spell towards Ronan. Ronan reacts quickly to block the attack but is pushed backward a little bit. Eduin laughs and smirks, saying to Ronan, what an unexpected guest you are, you little brat, judging by how you dodged that, you looked like a pretty nimble one. While at the same moment, Eduin had conjured another fire attack on Ronan. Ronan is baffled by the size of his materialization of magic in a short time span, he ponders, these guys are no ordinary. Eduin questions Ronan, how did you get here, the security here isn't supposed to be broken that easily, Ronan reciprocated the question, saying I should be the one asking you that, what the hell are you guys doing here, and who are you, no matter how passionate your relationship is, coming all the way to this place isn't right. Eduin smirked, saying to Ronan, you should act up at least that much so it feels worth killing you. Cyrilla said to Eduin, we are wasting time. Eduin, laughing sinisterly, said with excitement, there is really not much time left now, is there, the day that this empire will be buried in starlight, it's coming. Ronan was enraged, his eyes red, emitting a killing aura, recalling the event that led to his regression, the bald giant monster that appeared led to the end of humanity, he was enraged, he questioned Eduin, what did you just say, are you uttering those words without understanding their meaning, you rat bastard. Eduin took notice of the sudden change in the atmosphere, Ronan addressed the two individuals, commanding, both of you will need to come with me because it seems like I will have a lot of questions ready for you too. Eduin laughed at the command, remarking to Ronan, has this little brat really lost his mind, you're going to capture us, do you think that's even possible? Before he could finish his statement, Ronan, moving like the flash, swiftly chopped off the hand Eduin had raised to attack, Ronan calmly stated, is it so, just lie down quietly. 
Edwin was in severe pain screaming in agony, disbelieving at how he wasn't even able to react to Ronan's speed of attack, Cirilla, having just witnessed everything, couldn't believe the sudden turn of events and how Edwin wasn't able to react at all, she was shocked and frightened, Ronan wasted no time, going straight for his new opponent, he stretched forth his hand, grabbing Cirilla's throat, her veins popping out, with a serious face and a deep voice, Ronan said to her, from this point on, it'll be a good idea to answer me obediently, unless you want to become like that. Cirilla, hanging onto dear life, in a desperate struggle against Ronan's strangulation, manages to utter a life-saving incantation Ma. Ma Mana Shield. Creating a mana shield to protect herself from the imminent danger. Despite the initial resilience of Cirilla's mana shield, Ronan, displaying exceptional speed and skill, swiftly breaks through it with ease. Cirilla is left in shock as Ronan effortlessly slices through her mana shield, revealing the formidable nature of his abilities. In the midst of the intense confrontation, Ronan swiftly subdues Cirilla, causing her considerable pain. He questions her identity as a half-elf and demands answers about her companions. Meanwhile, Edwin seizes the opportunity to counterattack, surprising Ronan with a fire explosion. However, Ronan effortlessly dispels the spell, expressing disbelief at Edwin's regenerated hand and unusual appearance. Ronan taunts Edwin about his altered form, leading to a heated exchange between the two. I in the midst of a tense confrontation, Edwin provokes Ronan by labeling him a virgin loser. Ronan, unfazed, counters that Edwin hasn't grasped the severity of the situation. In a disturbing turn, Ronan stabs the defenseless Cirilla in the thigh, escalating the conflict. With a serious demeanor, he warns Edwin about the consequences of underestimating him. As Ronan pulls the sword from Cirilla's thigh, he demands a choice, follow quietly or face further brutality. Edwin, fueled by rage, contemplates his response, while Ronan questions the potential consequences of amputation on Cirilla. The atmosphere intensifies as the characters navigate the perilous encounter. Edwin reluctantly agrees to follow Ronan's command, prompting Ronan to express relief and a desire to avoid further bloodshed. However, Ronan is puzzled by Cirilla's sinister smile. Unbeknownst to him, a dormant Gant suddenly attacks, catching Ronan off guard. Despite Ronan's attempt to block the attack, the force proves overwhelming, sending him crashing through the wall. As the dust settles, Edwin checks on Cirilla, who credits him for diverting Ronan's attention. Cirilla reveals her gratitude, explaining that Edwin's distraction allowed her to cast a recognition-hindering spell and activated the Gant. Cirilla, having activated the giant's arm, informs Edwin about Ronan's significant injuries. Edwin advises Cirilla to go to the church and report the situation while expressing his intent to confront Ronan. Cirilla cautions Edwin about Ronan's formidable nature, describing him as a beast in the form of a child. Edwin reassures Cirilla, vowing not to underestimate Ronan again. However, before Edwin can finish his statement, Ronan swiftly severs all of Edwin's limbs, ruthlessly incapacitating him. Ronan's sudden and brutal attack leaves Edwin incapacitated and defenseless. Ronan, fueled by anger, stands defiantly despite his injuries, demanding answers from Cirilla. Cirilla, astonished by Ronan's resilience, questions how he managed to survive such severe wounds. Ronan, still seething with rage, declares his intent to not let her escape. Before he can finish his statement, a surge of excruciating pain overwhelms him, forcing him to kneel. While Cirilla is left puzzled by this unexpected turn, she prioritizes reporting the situation cause Ronan is a living disaster and swiftly conjures a portal for escape. In a final exchange, she warns Ronan that she will unravel every detail about him, including his family, lover, and friends, with a disgusted and angered expression. Her ominous threat lingers in the air as she vows to steal away everything that matters to him. Ronan remembering the events that lead to his regression is was in deep thought as he's yet to find any clue to that event. He screamed in desperation for her to stop. 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 Ronan fueled by anger, stands defiantly despite his injuries, demanding answers from Cirilla. Cirilla, astonished by Ronan's resilience, questions how he managed to survive such severe wounds. Her ominous threat lingers in the air as she vows to steal away everything that matters to him. 
Just as Cirilla attempts to make her way through the portal, a powerful aura permeates the scene, introducing a new character. Professor Nabirose makes a timely entrance, and her sheer presence immobilizes Cirilla. Fear takes hold of Cirilla as Professor Nabirose questions her about meddling with her disciple. Nabirose angered by their audacity to hurt her disciple. The atmosphere thickens as the characters stand at a critical juncture, with unanswered questions lingering and a new force entering the fray. This is where the chapter ends. <laughs>